You're listening to the All Things Geekery podcast. This is episode three of season four, and this one's called It's Contagious. I'm your host, Detached. Hey, guys, and I'm Victus. Well, guys, welcome to 2020. This is the year of being contagious and running out of TP. So we hope you all have had an absolute amazing week. And if you are new around here, then we get to uh, hang out with you. And we thank you for stopping in, checking out the show. And we hope you guys enjoy this episode. In this episode, we're going to first talk about the most recent season that hit for Destiny. Next, we'll dive into the latest details regarding the very much anticipated release of Baldur's Gate 3. Getting in some tabletop fun, we're going to talk about the sci-fi cult favorite, sci-fi cult favorite game, now pending to be released board game, Dune. Interested on that one. Uh, Wrapping up the podcast, then we'll give you our thoughts on the most recent episodes of Picard with, of course, some tech and conference talk in there. Before we get to that, though, it's been a little bit. It has what been a little have bit. You been, it's been a little bit. What have you been up to do that? Uh, well, not podcasting, because last week for why didn't we why didn't we podcast last week? I don't even remember now. Uh, pretty sure it was your fault. See, why? Why you got to blame me? <laughs> Cause, because I guess I don't want it to be my fault. Uh huh. Not like, you know, I oh. wasn't working on a script or anything, anything like That's that. That's what it was. Of course not. Well, you typically don't ever work on the scripts anyways, but uh, <laughs> I was working. That's what it was. Oh, you know, making the yep. chat. Got those real life things. Yeah. Re- you know, real life always has, seems to stand in the way for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, but it has been a little bit. If It's only been a week, but it seems like it's been a little bit um, outside mm-hmm. of that. <laughs> Literally just running and gunning, it seems. This week has been really, really freaking busy. Um, I think I've maybe played a video game two hours, maybe three this entire week. So outside were, of that. Before that, you were playing a lot of um, Red Dead Redemption. Like you were yeah. playing that hot and heavy. Couldn't I, get you to stop talking about it. Yeah, so main the game is finished i've i've pretty much wrapped up everything that i can for now i've still got a few things to go do in it for my completionist um, mentality you know i like to check everything off inside those types of games which is a lot um this is one of the biggest games i've ever played from a from a console standpoint but probably looking around 70 maybe 70 plus hours of story Wow. Yeah, it's huge. And then on uh, top of that, I would think you can even like draw that out even more for a game well, like that. Definitely all the side missions and there's just so many things to do. Um, best, best story I've played in a long time. It was actually the ending of it was really sad. I actually, there was a little bit of a tear that kind of formed. Then, uh, so you're playing that. Um, me personally, what i've been up to um uh, been playing a lot of minecraft for streaming which decided to do the old uh hardcore playthrough and that was fun up until i died yeah kind of you <laughs> messed that up <laughs> yeah i totally I, I and this was this was completely on me i really even from the beginning i did not have the mentality of you know, I should probably make sure before I take my next step into this adventured area, think about how I'm not going to die. Nope. I went in there guns blazing and pissed off a whole bunch of Endermen. And even though I would thought I was decked out, I could not. I could just couldn't recover and I ended up dying. <laughs> so now, thing was, anybody, was, this, was anybody with you or was it just you? Solo? It, it was a solo playthrough. Um, so I was just kind of going around doing things and building up uh Built up a couple large buildings um, that I spent a lot of time on. So because of those buildings, I didn't let the world completely die. I recovered it by a black magic. So the worlds are still there. Places still there. Um, you're just, you're but, just not playing the hardcore mode, right? Yeah. If I go back to it, um, I'll, I'll have a hardcore turned off 
Uh, but as far as the playthrough, it, it's basically done, which is actually teed it up quite well for going to the next game, which I was starting planning on playing um, on Monday, which will actually be today on release day. Um, with that, also been getting into uh, some Stellarius on the PC, which oh. for all you other listeners, if you are uh, a fan of 4X RTS, uh, just grand scale strategy, most Stellarius especially especially in space Stellarius is fantastic um it can definitely bog you down if you play some really large maps but uh the customizability of what you could build a race to be in it and then every game is different of what could outcome it's That's a cool. big look, current learning curve um but i'm playing through that again for probably the 15th time playthrough i don't know and I count 15 of all those, probably three of them were successful playthroughs because yeah, there's I've, ways in the games that humble you very quickly. I've only had a couple of successful playthroughs on that game. That's rough. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. Well, that's been a lot of the gameplay I've been going into. Um, nice. I picked up uh, XCOM 2 and Civ 6. So oh, maybe geez. in a couple of years, we'll tech out those. Because <laughs> yeah, a couple of years. <laughs> the, 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 um, <laughs> Yeah, they, they're now in the backlog, so. You know, yeah. as far as gaming, like, my backlog is kind of shrinking. Of, you know, taking a break from, you know, some of the bigger games. Played uh, played through a lot of my story games. Catching up on some stuff. Um, outside of that, I just have not had a lot of time to game. So, um, I have been writing, though. So, nice. my uh, mold fingers have been busy on the novel. And uh, that's coming along quite nicely. I, and this is cool. something I actually haven't talked a whole lot about. Um, I think yeah, I'm go ahead. in general is just, uh, you know, writing. So, yeah, been writing again. It's been it's been fun. Don't you have like the first book done or are you still working on that one? Uh, first book is basically done. It is partially edited, but not fully edited. And second book is started. Um. It, it's definitely a work in progress. It's, you know, it's been kind of a lifelong writing for this novel. Um, there are six books and I've got four of them plotted. So it's, uh, you know, a massive undertaking and, uh, yeah, it's fun, but definitely a massive undertaking. Yeah, I can imagine it's always thought about writing, but I'm too distracted to to stay oh, it, on topic for long it's I like so reading, hard but yeah it's so hard thinking of the topics so, and, and building out a world very impressive and, and props to you for keeping on that this is this has been an eight to ten year journey so far of writing through you know one and three quarters of a book and plotting out six nice yeah it's a lot just you know creating your own worlds and just having some freedom in writing and, you know, there's been tons of breaks and this life happens with that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So I would say that's, uh, that's kind of my uh, last probably three weeks. Very cool. Yeah. It's good stuff. Anyways, I think it's time for some gaming topics. How about you? Uh, I think so, too. I yeah. Think so. And we mentioned one about this, this interesting game called Destiny. Um, Ugh. That we, we have never talked about before. Ever. We ever, um, I mean, never spent we, entire episodes Destiny talking about. I, I don't, I don't know if what is play Destiny Two, uh, but yeah, new season of Destiny Two hit. Uh, what was it last Tuesday? Last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, season of the worthy, and uh, in build out of the end of last season, season of the dawn, it laid the groundwork and, and painted the picture that um, Destiny Two was getting Trials of Osiris back. Uh, which is the much anticipated and um, much asked for to come back PVP type because it's basically the pinnacle PVP type. Uh, you oh. you set out as a team of three, yeah, to fight against other teams of threes in this Super basically leader leaderboard type system where you have a card. The card has seven slots on it, seven yeah. points. Yep, and 
as you win those, you only fight other people that also have won that many wins on the card. So by the, the last match, you would be a card of six versus another person, another team that has cards of six. Right. Um, so it's all about, yeah. you know, who's the best. It's basically competitive on crack. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's where all the pros went to, went to sharpen, sharpen their swords against or, you know, oh, grind sure. against to really improve. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and, and you, you come out of there and you get to show off that trials armor. I mean, well, I'm, I'm referencing back to the D one days. You were the stuff you knew that this person, um, aside of carries, which nothing against those, uh, you knew that they were, they had, they had skills, right? They, yeah. they can do it, especially cause they were, you know, they were hawk their emblems and, and special stuff that they, the weapons, especially that's like, yeah, I got this from trials. It's, well, it's funny. It's funny too because the uh, the trials competitive nature is a lot different than just your regular competitive group, and uh, there's a lot more strategy in in trials than there ever was in any of your regular competitive. You know, your iron banners and, and any of that. So uh, I'm glad that they waited so long to bring it back, and and I have not played the new one yet, but I hope that they have done this one right. Um, I loved old trials back in destiny one. It was a crap ton of fun. And yeah, uh, you know, me and you even played through, uh, through trials for, I don't know, quite, we played pretty often if I remember right. Um, and it's funny out of all of my characters that I played, you know, I've, I've mained a hunter for years and the only one that I ever enjoyed playing trials with was my warlock. Really? My warlock was the only one that I ever ended up. Um, I had a full set of uh, trials armor out of uh, out of that. But also the in in D one with the warlock, um, you had self res, so that was and, an instant. Yeah, that was basically what a lot of people that had struggled at running the others, which is struggled in trials period, ran oh. warlock, so they could oh, have yeah. an extra life, basically. Yep, for sure. <sighs> so. Uh, you know, like I said, I haven't played the new trials. It does look pretty amazing. Have watched quite a few of the the top uh, top guys playing it. the The season in general is pretty lackluster, honestly. Outside of trials, for me, the I don't know. I've I've hopped in for just a little bit to to play some of the the content that's out there, and uh, in the the season is called Season of the Worthy. But honestly, it is truly just a public event grind some of the new materials and things that you can get there's a lot of it but really the story is is really slow to progress so far than before i've noticed so yeah this was this was definitely uh um finally a mode or a season for pvp really and yeah, you know they, they tried to try to bring in a story for uh or to continue the um, story from season of dawn into season of worthy so you get that you know basis is the cabal are now desperate they they didn't succeed with the, the sundial uh to change time so now they're basically going to do on a a suicide mission per se <laughs> yeah, literally i mean you, you know that big big thing that was absorbing or targeted the sun to Possibly, you know, blow up the sun. We disabled it and blow it up because, well, it blows up. It blows up everything else. So uh, the basis is, well, they're just going to turn around and aim it at Earth on a collision course. Yeah. Um, and your goal is to stop them. Your goal is to uh, do these events, uh, which are called um, Seraph Tower events. Yeah. Uh, which, the, the, you know, which are unique. Events. Um, oh, yeah, public they're public events. events. <laughs> Those are public events, which they're different. Um, I think yeah, they are. Just they're a lot turning different. Turning on and arming Rasputin, which is correct. Interesting in that, you know, we were all very scared of arming Rasputin, except for those that are on Rasputin's side. Um, I'm on Rasputin's side, but there's always those out there like Zavala that doesn't want to give him any weapons. But hey, let's go arm him with stuff. You know, from a from a story progression point, I like that we've kind of come back to the whole Rasputin story 
that was a neat storyline with Mars. And I, you know, I like what they're doing with it. And the Cabal have always been a, a major part of Destiny 2's storyline. So I like that, uh, you know, they're kind of doing this one last uh, yeehaw with the Cabal. And yeah. we get a we get to see some more lore and figure out some more stuff with uh, old Rasputin and maybe uh, get to see some more of him, like the actual Rasputin bot. It's kind of cool. Or, yeah, get to interact with him a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, people are saying it's very light on PB. I, I see more content being released in this season as we move along, just like how we saw with Season of the Dawn where as we, you know, there was different bosses that were unlocked and you kind of progressed a little bit with the story there that you, you had the event which happened with, um, with Bastion unlocking that content. Yeah. Um, well, there's definitely so far, gonna be content come. Yeah. Which so far we only know of one exotic weapon, um, coming so far with seasons, uh, whether that, is going to stay as just one weapon. Very interesting. Tommy gun type weapon. Tommy's matchbook was out there. It seems like a new weapon. It's kind of like the uh, Ariana's vow type release of the weapon that we've had in previous. And I have to, I have to say the, the matchbook, you know, the exotic that they give you, you know, if you've pre-ordered is actually pretty decent. It's kind of fun to play with. Um, You can make some nasty builds, um, dropping some some different uh, different key things in there. It's fun to play with. Um, yeah. There there are more exotic quests coming. We know that the fourth horseman, the famous four oh, barrel yes. shoddy, yes, is we've seen back. him. We saw that in some of the trailer pictures, which yeah, is funny. So funny reading that on a, a person that doesn't hasn't played Destiny before. They're like. Oh, it looks like we get this new shotgun. Um, <laughs> right. Pretty sure like, it's mm. it, uh, coming out to be the fourth horseman is what we're reading. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, you didn't play D1 at you all. You did not play D1 at all because that was the <laughs> boss melter back in. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely some memories with that one. So uh, apparently there's going to be a storyline quest uh, with Zavala. So. And I kind of like these little mini missions that they're doing you know we saw one last season with the bow that came out um the exotic bow and um i cannot think of the name of it for the life of me but it wasn't a long quest but it was still fun you got to see leviathan's breath uh, yes leviathan's breath thank thank you um Uh yeah i you know it wasn't a ton of story content and people were like oh you know we we paid money we should have gotten more there was a lot of stuff that 10 bucks destiny pumped out a lot of material and you know this season even though we we pre-ordered we got it out of the bundle if people didn't they paid 10 bucks for this season there's still a lot coming i mean you've got trials which is open to anybody depending on their their level you have to be a certain level to open it but it is free once you hit that level there's the little bit of story and the content that you're getting you got the exotic quest that's dropping for the fourth horseman. And we also, um, we've seen that there's an unidentified heavy weapon in the, in the slot. So if you oh. look at your, if you go look at your inventory and it's not been confirmed, but they think it is going to be one of the cabal Gatlin guns, one of the heavy bent up Gatlin guns that the, cabal brutes carry around that is actually going to be um the exotic heavy machine gun that we get so not quite sure how that's going to tie in if it's going to drop from maybe a story piece that we get with the almighty and trying to stop it and uh, doing that piece or or what so not really sure how that's going to play in of course you know we got iron banner through the season we've got more pvp content um there's quite a bit this season yeah yeah um especially what you know we have it's just released and people are judging it by that and i think it, it accomplishes one thing it was to get trials out the door and to get people you know geared up for that now yes 
currently, you know, the, the story on the PVE part's a little light, but I see that improving over time with, with the trials part where it's done, right? It, the trials, you can go in and you can compass what you need to in trials, which is get into lighthouse, get your gear, um, get your armor. Um, now, is there weapons to go with trials currently? There, there is. Yes, there okay. are. Um, it's they, they are not called the same thing. If I remember right, there's of course the introduction of the fusion rifle. Um, there is a rocket launcher. I do not think that there is a pulse rifle. This go around, there is a auto rifle. It looks just like the doctrine of passing but it is not called the Doctrine of Passing. And then they brought the scout rifle back, the Scholar, that they had in D1. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it's got a few different perks on it. It's got no distractions, which is kind of cool for a scout. Full auto, and I don't remember the other. Of course, these are all static rolls on these weapons, if I remember right. No, they're mm-hmm. not static. Okay. They do change, but the static piece of it is um, once you get to your first three wins, you get a roll. Once you get to your first five wins, you get a roll. And of course, on your seventh win, if you go flawless. Okay. So it's nice. five and seven. Those are those are the the drops. And of course, there's random loot that will that will drop as well. Of course, there's a bounty system from saint 14 that you can pick up and there are different um cards that you can play in there as well so just like back in uh d1 when brother vance was the vendor um Mm -hmm. saint 14 is actually the vendor for this one now yeah i be good to hear him as the announcer i i need to go watch some of the trials playthroughs and hear him as the announcer all of it it yeah, it's 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 good. Just <laughs> him having that Russian accent, he he definitely says some funny things. And, uh, what I've seen so far of some of the people playing trials is they've they've done a pretty legit job of of keeping everything uh, as we remembered it. Um, fun, hard, wetty as crap, and uh, I did see a note from Bungie. Uh, it was sometime last week. I don't remember what the day was specifically, but they talked about um, keeping an eye on the banner hammer and um, they have found a new group of cheaters that have found some way of cheating within trials and some of the competitive realms, some new, some new software that they've gotten a hold of. So just yeah. some I- warnings out there. People were hoping for it, and then they did it like the day of release for trials, where they brought in and banned a whole bunch of people. It was, yeah, it was very sweet. It very was sweet. A lot. <laughs> 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 um, you know, from a from a Destiny Two standpoint, um, I'm just not very motivated to play it right now. Um, we ground the heck out of Destiny last season. I played a ton. And uh, it's just nice to have a little break. And I kind of like yeah. the fact that we've got these different seasons that we can do that in. And mm-hmm. uh, honestly, the the rewards and stuff that I'm seeing from your season pass isn't anything that I really want. And I like that option. Like the fact that, you know, if I buy a game and it's got a season pass with it and uh, let's say we're on the third out of out of four and... I love the first and second one, but I hated the third one. Then I'm still okay with that. I mean, I still only paid 40 bucks for the season pass. Right. And I'm getting tons of content. Yeah. Uh, personally for me, that's, that's just me though. Tons of people out there, you know, whine and complain that they, they're not getting enough or it's too much or they can't keep up. And I don't know. I just, I kind of like the whole, the, the whole uh, rollout system that they've got going on with this, this drip feed. Seems yep. nice. And personally, this this season with it being um, PvP po- focused so far is I'll keep up with the story to understand what's going on. But yeah, um, same with you. You know, we 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 did a lot of grinding in uh, Shadowkeep and Season of the Dawn. 
And, you know, I can say it exactly what it is, a little burnout. And I was also enjoying going to other games and having that breath of fresh air. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely been fun playing the uh, the other the other backlog and new games that we've got out there. Um, speaking of new games, I've got uh, uh, we've got one coming up that's actually pretty exciting for me. Um, I love the the first two, and that is Baldur's Gate three, which hit. Uh, wh- when was the release of their gameplay review? Did it was back in was it January, February? Which was that? Baldur's Gate three, the game preview. That I want to say no. that was back in like January or February. I don't remember. It has been a a while since I saw the original preview. What's crazy is that it has been 20 years since the release of the second game. That's that that's longer than see Starcraft was what, 10 years, 10 and they went 10 years. So 20 years getting a sequel has been 20 years in the making. Uh, Baldur's Gate 1 came out in 98. Baldur's Gate 2 came out in 2000. Guys, 2000. I believe it was September of 2000, if I remember right. Almost 20 years. If it was September of 2020, it would be 20 years, which is bonkers. I mean, that's. There's a little bit of hesitation to something like that because you're the last time we had games like that. You're thinking, dude, Nukem. Uh, what yes, else? has there's, it there's been one other long. game that's yeah, the one other game that was came out after a long time and wasn't the best. Well, I mean, take Doom for instance. I mean, Doom had a really pause before the the latest one that we uh, we just saw came out. Right, but in my anyways. opinion, Doom, uh, the most recent one that released in 2014, Doom, right. uh, hit all the marks. It was the modern adaptation of Doom, and it, you know, it's the reason why we're getting Doom Eternal, and people are just hyped for it. So, you know, I put that one in a win. Um, oh, yeah. No, but they, I could, they, guess you could also, right. because, yeah, they did it right. Um, you could look at who's developing Baldur's Gate 3. Um, Larian Studios, which is, if you aren't familiar with that studio, is the team behind Divinity Original Sin, Divinity Original Sin 2, which, in my opinion, is one of the best uh, modern, top-down RPG games to date. I would definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah. it, it is fantastic story. The stuff you can do in those games, the customizability, um, I might go back to the story depth. I mean, there's just so much there, so much there uh, of how to play through and the difficulties. And um, I recommend it to anyone going through that. But yeah, uh, they, sure. they, they got they got the. Uh, old reins to it, uh, and we've seen gameplay. Uh, we you were able to a lot of gameplay, a lot of gameplay. Some people were actually able to play it. You see. Or no, it. No, it was just the demo, which was on February 27th. Okay. With the head of Alarian Studios at PAX East uh, going That's off right. a demo, uh, which he basically showed like the first. It's like an hour and a half where the game. Hour and a half was. of the gameplay. Uh, yeah. a bit, he, uh, because this is based off of um, the Dungeon Dragons uh, 5E base set for chances, rolling, et cetera. Uh, his first combat, he died, so he had to reset. So, uh, so funny. Yeah, uh, it really goes to show a lot. Really, anything can happen. Um, and, and it's a dice roll. There, you, there is no guarantee. Ninety percent chance you may still miss because that dice yeah. roll, which is amazing. Uh, <laughs> but the combat system, the UI, the the graphics. Um, uh, uh, we're talking about the combat system itself. Looks very. Uh, actually looks um, looks familiar to what we've been used to in Divinity Original Sin, which some people yeah. are taken aback by that. They're like, uh, it's a Divinity Original Sin with a 
Boulder's Gate mod or skin mod. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I saw a lot of that. A lot of that. Yeah, there like, was a lot of that. Hate chat you know going what? on. I, I'm not mad. I'll be. I haven't played Boulder's Gate one and two, so you know you can start okay. raging right now that I know nothing that I'm talking what? about. What in the world? But well, it's a 20 year old game. I didn't well, come I, into that field. I get that it's a 20 year old game. I, like, I'm honest with you, I think I may have picked up Baldur's Gate 2 when it, I mean, wow. when it was like a couple cents or, or whatever. I mean, it was like 90% off. Well, did, have you never played? Uh, like, uh, now I'm just stuck on that. Like, how have you never <laughs> played these games? <laughs> I just, just haven't got around to it. Like, I, oh my every gosh. time I think about it, I was like, yeah, I'm going to play something else. Yeah, I guess I'm else or to do. I get, then I'll play, or like, I'll think about playing it. And then I started playing Division Real of Sin. So, you know, it's. <laughs> they, Table they, talk, you know, cross up between yeah. two very fantastic RPGs. They were really good. You know, if you if you were a Dungeon and Dragons fan, then Baldur's Gate was, you know, just it had that feel to it. Yeah. There, there really just wasn't anything like it back then. But regarding what we see on the gameplay, the SGI looks the same, and even uh the character select is uh very similar to oh almost uh, identical almost identical to the original sin uh but what is unique that i i don't remember ever seeing in uh divinity is when you go into cutscenes, it's almost like a witcher cutscene. yeah where it's brought down to that person's level you have dialogue uh you don't just have chat windows um it's very much like you'd all of a sudden hopped right from the vintage original sin original, you know, it top down conversation down to what we we've experienced in normal, you know, third person RPGs. I, I reference Witcher uh, regarding all the conversations there in, in the big conversations that we saw. Now, some are minor ones and they don't take place that way. Um, but that that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool on that point. Yeah, I I do like that. But again, it's, this was just a game preview that we saw. So uh, who knows yeah, who I, knows what the final finished product is even going to look like. Right. Um, what else to notate here? Gra- graphics look just as amazing as any uh, as the Divinity Riddle Sin top down. Yeah. Yes, it looks similar, but the combat is different in so much that you don't fight your um, who who goes into what order is not determined on a per person or per character. It's on a per team per team. So it's, so. it's kind of turn-based, but not right. It's turn-based it's, so much as, as your team, which completely changed the dynamic of fight because you were then relying very heavily on the combos of your of, persons. Yeah. Of your team. Set them up just right. Strategies. So I think, uh, this is either going to be a make it or break it for me. Um, you know, the turn-based strategy games like this, if it's done right, can be a lot of fun. Like you said, if depending on your team's ability to create combos, um, could be a lot of fun. Or you know, if people suck, then probably not going to have a probably not going to have a good day. Yeah. And that's what's different about this one is you can go a lot off of just stats in if you played um, DOS of Individual Sin. But in this one, it's like like we've talked about. It's based on the Dungeon Dragons as you've been used to with the rest of the Gate. So um, battles, anything you try to execute is always based on the dice roll of some points. And you can stack it pretty heavily, but there's there's a chance you will fail. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. A um, few other points on this one. The uh, CEO, there was a talk he was doing a few weeks back. They were talking about tying in some of the original story and bringing back some of the original characters, like returning characters into the storyline. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to play in. Honest, I don't even remember how the second one ended, so I'm going to have to go back and even like watch some videos and look at things to see what uh, see what the story ended with. And uh, they also talked about the 
character classes on anything that you can select. So for you Dungeons and Dragons fans out there, anything uh, that you guys can think of from the clerics to the fighters, the rangers, the rogue classes, the warlocks, the wizards, um, they said that all of those classes are going to be early access for uh, for us to be able to play, which is pretty cool. That's a big selection of classes to be able to slide through for early access gaming. Yeah. And then uh, have they put a release date for it? I have not heard of a release date yet. If they've if they've put one out, but I haven't gone out to their website or, or checked their their Twitter feed or anything, so they could have. Uh, all release date is just twenty twenty. Yeah, <laughs> kind of what kind of what so, I was thinking. Yeah, so still up in the air. Um, I'm gonna have to do a lot of back reading on the lore of Baldur's Gate to understand us, you know, to go into an understanding where we're at in Baldur's Gate three. Cause you know, we've even been told, you know, there's the, the returning characters like, okay, I, I kind of need to know the background. So it's a, it's a big story. I mean, dun, dungeons and dragons in general is enormous. So any, any story spinoff that you get from, from that line and, uh, there's there's just too much to even think about right well and and the lore the lore behind this was actually when we were writing this script i was like how much do we actually want to talk about and get into because you know then my (laughs) mind started going down the dungeon and dragons line and talking about the the enemies and lore behind it and little creatures that you got to see in some of the gameplay and what they actually did and how they worked and yeah, well, maybe we save that for our, hey Baldur's Gate three review podcast. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll do a here's the lore and look at all this useless crap that pours out of detached head when it comes to uh, <laughs> lore lore. Uh-huh. Yeah, I read a lot. I I do. I I listen to a lot. I read a lot, and I don't know. It just kind of sticks up there. I don't yep. know why, but. That's basically uh-huh. all we know of Baldur's Gate 3 so far. Uh, we got that uh, gameplay, some cinematic, which is gorgeous. Uh, just absolutely phenomenal. I hope all the cinematics throughout the entirety of the game is that way. Oh, I um, hope so. Yeah. Um, then we uh, talking about a item that is from a long distant past. Oh, very. <laughs> you know, uh, a long distant past and i have to say i think this is the first time this topic has made it onto the podcast it has i i don't it's think first time we talk about, about this um yeah. just just dune in general dune uh, in general or tabletop a tabletop game specifically i don't think we've talked about a tabletop game specifically on the show. But no, we I know have we not. haven't. I know we haven't talked about Dune. One of my favorite books of all time. Okay. I was doing a quick search here and I thought I was gonna have to correct myself because like I swore there was a Dune game. But <laughs> it's based on I wonder if they go off the book or the uh, game. Be interesting. What did you find? I'm curious. Well, it depends on where you look. You have a, uh, this particular one is from Wikipedia. Dune is 1992 act, uh, adventure strategy video game. Oh, based on the book. Okay, so they could go off either one. Well, I knew I there was a book. What system but, did that come out on? Uh, MDOS and Mega CD. Oh, geez. 1992. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's been a while. Uh, it has it's been, been a while. I, I, clearly don't even remember if i have played those i don't remember them at all yeah um uh, wow but you know they've they, they're mentioned from as cult classics for those that were able to play the game experience the game um you can see a screenshot of it it's very rough but uh the the depth and, and what is brought about from in the story of dune is what brings a lot of people back to reminiscing about it and, and what they experienced have you, in it. Have you read the book? 
I have not. Oh my gosh. Have you watched I, the I'm movie? Uh, well, there was a movie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there sure was. So if you have Ugh, not watched 1984, you, oh my. If you, oh yes. If you have not watched the movie or read the book, you got to. You just got to. You can, it literally cannot be classified a geek unless you have read that book or you have watched that movie. Huh. Dune is scheduled for a 2020 film. Yes, there is a. Interesting. I don't remember if they said it was going to be a sequel, prequel, or a remake. Does it say? Does not say. Gives a synopsis, but doesn't reference the original movie. So I think so. I think they are doing a sequel to the movie. And okay. if you guys if you guys have no idea what we're talking, about, it was a novel written years and years ago uh, by Frank Herbert. So Frank Herbert wrote this uh, very interesting sci-fi world book called Dune. And uh, yep. one of the best books out there when it comes to sci-fi fantasy, um, kind of this post-apocalyptic, um, got to save the world, giant worms. They call it Dune because, of course, there's this massive sand world. Lots of stuff. Very, very exciting. Got to, got to read it. So, I forgot that they were coming out with a movie. You said 2020, and I'm like, whoa. Yeah, I didn't even I realize they were coming out the movie. But apparently it has a, yeah. a release date in the U.S. of December 18th, 2020. I hope they do it right. Um, the, the old Dune that was made uh, early 80s, 82, 83, maybe 84, somewhere in there, uh, didn't do all that great. It has a massive cult following because of the fans of, uh, you know, Frank and, and, and the world that he created. But, uh, yeah, not, not one from just, Hey, I want to go watch this movie. Let's throw it in and watch it. It's, uh, uh, a little odd. <laughs> so yeah, unless you're just one of those sci-fi geeks that love old cheesy sci-fi movies, you probably will not enjoy doing it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I can already tell you, a lot of those like sci-fi that released in, in that period of time mm -hmm. are pretty bad yeah yeah yep they 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 had their they had their time so that's what we need to do we need to do an 80s sci-fi movie review 80s, 90s. One night. remember yep yeah but um okay i'll throw some 90s in there yeah you think we've even got to do some 70s there's some really good 70s sci-fi films out there really are Ugh. oof yeah. All I think about is those like their attempt at graphics. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Well, you shiver. so if you even go back, I mean, go back to the fifties, fifties, even some of the original, like old school, black and white forties and fifties sci-fi films that were out there. Like, uh, the day the earth stood still. I mean, when you think forties and fifties, and the movie technology they had for sci-fi stuff like that. Um, kind of unprecedented for what they did. And then, mm -hmm. you know, fast forward 40 years to things like Dune. And Dune was really set apart for its time era. Unfortunately, the, the book that Frank wrote, um, they just didn't have the technology back then to be able to do a movie that was, um, that, that could hold up to it. So I'm really hoping that the movie, um, and I'd forgotten all about it, that uh, is coming out. I hope they do a good job, but I think we're way off topic too, because uh, we weren't even planning on talking about movies. We were talking about, <laughs> no. talking about the, uh, the tabletop game of, yes, Disney we haven't even out. talked about it yet. We haven't even talked about it. So uh, the game that is releasing uh, is called adventures in the Imperium. It's going to be a tabletop. Um, it's not a whole lot to talk about right now. Um, there's, there's uh, some chatter in the tabletop community going on about it. Um, some of the information that I've found on it is that the game is going to be using the 2D20 system. Uh, and this is from Modifius's system that they created. Mm -hmm. 
So if you guys are uh, familiar with the Modifius's 2D20 system, that is all around um, a narrative driven dice roll. So it's very um, systematic for the way things are produced in the game and it creates a different outcome. Uh, basically, that's all that 2D20 is. <laughs> um, outside of the 2D20 system, they said that they're going to be. Um, uh, did they give a date? Shoot. I don't remember if they gave a date for it. I don't think they let's did. find out. Mighty Google. What do you say? Yeah, I don't remember if they had a date for it or not. I don't think they did. Um, they they did say it's going to go into beta testing soon. OK. Is it a I Kickstarter? Do. I believe it was. Yeah. OK. That's good. Then they got the funding for it. If they're pushing it this far. I don't see a date for it either. Anyways, there is a link that I found beta testing. So that's something that we'll throw in the show notes for you guys. Um, if you want to join in and, and follow their progress and kind of where things are, going, throw that in there. Um, some of the other pieces that they talked about, um, they, they talked about being able to join uh, one of the existing houses. Um, and then they also talked about the, the game is all going to be centered around Frank's classic um, sci-fi book. So there's going to be some of the political natures that the book had for the time is going to be built into the game as well. Um, and then you're going to have things like spies and mercenaries and um, criminals that are uh, given these different agendas that can go into these houses that you can be a part of. So honestly, it sounds pretty legit. It would be a tabletop game that I would want to sit down and play for sure. Yeah. But that's really all I know. I mean, I searched and searched and searched and searched and I found like five bullet points on this game. Which was uh, probably how a lot of people don't know about it. I mean, I know I know people that are pretty, um, pretty heavy in the tabletop, um, especially those that are like the sci fi, you know, those build upon it. And I, I know a lot of DD players and I haven't heard anybody mention this, so it's, it's kind of flying under the radar right at the moment. Uh, but exciting yeah. because it pulls in both a um, the dynamic storytelling with with chance dice roll with the world of Dune all into one package. So yeah, I, for me it's exciting. Um, I love I love Dune. I love that sci fi feel that the the book had, and uh, yeah, this should be this should be exciting. I hope that they get the funding and they're able to to make it past these betas and that they are successful. Yep. But we'll see when they actually get a time for that. Maybe knowing it's a Kickstarter with some of these tabletops, it takes a while for them to actually get a release. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes yeah. something happens and it just doesn't. So Yeah, definitely uh definitely so. All right. I think it's time for and if you guys didn't know this when we started the year, it was right when the new Star Trek Picard kicked off. And right. that was the very first, uh, we did the first three episodes in that podcast. So we did a quick review. Of course, it was some spoilers because the show had literally just come out. Um, this is probably not going to be a spoiler for anybody because it's a month after these episodes have finally come out. <laughs> yep. For some but, of these episodes. Yeah. So we're reviewing in this one episodes four, five, and six. And then we will end up waiting just a little bit longer because there's only 10 episodes total for Picard for season one. So they just finished up seven, eight's coming out this week. And then nine and 10. So we've got one, two, we've got a month. So hopefully by the end of this coming month, we'll have uh, the final review for the last four episodes on Picard as well. Kind of thinking that's how we'll play that. Just wrap it all up. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, but tonight we're actually uh, doing a quick on Picard episodes four, five, and six. And 
a couple of these episodes felt like filler episodes oh, to me. I a hundred percent agree. You know, yep. it, well, it did two things. One, it really kind of had that old Star Trek, the next generation feel to it. It, it had a little bit of that nostalgia and it also had that Star Trek next generation filler episode to me. It felt the same way. Now, in episode four, uh, that one was called Absolute Candor. And Jonathan Frakes, the actor who plays Commander Riker, was actually the director of that one. That one, that I didn't know. Yes. Uh, it's pretty yeah, cool. It, it is very cool. So he's always been a, a great actor when it comes to playing the, 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 the role of Commander Riker and just... He's a good director. Um, he's a writer as well. And he's had tons of screen time when it comes to just uh, the, the business of entertainment. Um, same with same with the guy who plays Picard. So those two those two kind of paired together uh, made quite a, uh, you know, quite a debut back in the back in the show. So it really kind of brought that. Star Trek Next Generation feel for these three episodes for me, but totally it was filler episodes. So. Yeah, a lot of it, like the entirety of Absolute Candor um, and we're just breaking down because I mean, builds off. Um, it does give us background into how Picard was seen going into before um, in his um, Post why he was still part of Starfleet coming into uh, Vashti, which is the planet here that it was a just Romulan relocation hub, uh, which in sense just is uh, when they were helping the Romulans move from their uh, Romu uh, Romulus because mm -hmm. the supernova was on its way. They're trying to get them all out of there. So some of them came to Vashti and basically Picard was greeted warmly. He was uh, some of them said some of them a hero uh, because of that. Uh, you know, built on this, and we get introduced to the character Elnor, uh, which he, he then becomes a, a mainstay in the rest of the episodes. So we we learn a bit more about his background, the um, the kind of monk like group, uh, yeah. Kawat Malat, that the uh, yeah, the nuns basically that they're all about um, finding the cause, finding the most lost cause, and binding them to that you know they're they're also known as one of the most fierce fighters um in the galaxy one of the best fighters in the galaxy yeah. for for them uh which uh elnor was a male most of them were female so that that was the oddity for him but he it sounded like he was a rescue um and he was turned over to them yeah and and raised with them raised them so and that was a good little background i i, I enjoyed here, like learning about that yeah but, uh, it, was, it was a neat little backstory um again to to your point you know the entire episode except for the last two seconds of the episode was total filler <laughs> yeah total, <laughs> total filler um out of out of all of them that i've watched so far that was probably my least favorite um not that it was bad it's just been my least favorite out of the bunch uh there just wasn't a a whole lot there outside of literally just Picard going to uh, the city and, and speaking with the, his, you know, past friends that he had made. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a little hard too because Patrick Stewart is not a young chicken anymore. I mean, he's mm -mm. late seventies, if not even early eighties now, I think it's late seventies. So the flashback scenes that they try to do, um, make it a little harder because he's really, you know, showing his age now versus when, uh, well, I mean, Star Trek Next Generation was goodness forever ago. I mean, I think the first episode aired in 90. I want to say it was 90. So a long time ago. Yeah. I believe, I believe Patrick was 40. 45 when the first episode came out maybe maybe just a little bit younger yep. 
So I mean, 30 he, plus just as a person, he's getting up there in age, but also the, the actor and person he's playing in, you know, <laughs> yeah, be a retired admiral. So, yeah, I mean, you, you look at you look at Picard, he's a retired admiral. He's literally spent his entire life in Starfleet. So, yeah, I think uh, I think overall the show has done a a good job of of sticking to its guns with the Star Trek theme. It's a little rougher around the edges than, you know, we were used to with some of the previous Star Treks. Um, there's language, there's vaping, there's tons of alcohol, there's just, you know, some <laughs> rough rough around the edges. Um, it's welcome, it's it welcome is definitely to- interesting seeing seeing a Star Trek that is of a more modern mature, mature yeah. yes take yeah. Welcome on, on 2020 uh, yeah basically is in some sense it's also it's kind of how we've we like mandalorian for star wars is that there are and yes there are some like okay yeah because he's the good guy he's got to do that but in other instances um it's the very the rough, the real, the reality, not uh, of Star Wars, the background stories that are told, you know, we get to experience that and have the losses or whatever goes along with it. The bad decision making, it's not just all sunshine and rainbows for the hero. Yeah. So. Well, and uh, I, I like what they've done. So, I'm, I mean, the Star Trek Next Generation show was by far one of my favorite just TV shows in general all around. And uh, I think I think they've done a good job with showing the age of Starfleet in this show and just where things have come in general. You know, they're they're starting to see some stuff just fall apart, which is cool. Right. Um, I like and I all like throughout the episodes. Going. Yeah, we like, see that. I like, yeah, I like it so far. Um, episode five and six, I think, did a really good job of continuing that story and just building on what they're doing. And I think. I think that's been the biggest thing so far is they're taking a movie perspective, but breaking it into a TV show and trying to continue that progression of a story. And I think that's what draws people's attention the most is uh, it's hard not to have filler episodes when you've got such a long period to, to do things in. Uh, it's a little easier when that time frame is smaller, but you know, uh, I, I like the characters they're bringing in, you know, episode five, we, we really get to see one of the most popular characters out there ever in the Star Trek, um, genre. And that is seven of nine, the, mm-hmm. the former, well, she's technically still a Borg, but not a Borg. Yeah. So she's she, not, she's no longer part of the collective. So she's not, right. As her individuality, her free will back. Yeah. Um, um, but I enjoyed that episode because it's probably the most human I've ever seen Seven of Nine act. And you oh, see for sure. a lot of the brokenness of being a Borg has brought out in her um, to, you know, throughout all of it. Uh, from the first first episode, the scene of it which is probably the most gory Star Trek has ever seen been. And some argued why that was necessary or why they put that in there. Um, yeah. The, uh, the, and, and there's the, a discussion on that, but we, right. Won't. Uh, but yeah, the, the, that, and then the, the fallout of what happened there where she basically had to, um, you know, she had a mercy kill her, her friend that was also a former Borg. Yeah. Um, uh, and harken back to if I grew up on the episodes of Star Trek Voyager. So it was cool oh seeing gosh. all these callbacks. <laughs> it is amazing the time difference. So, I mean, we, yeah. we grew up in the same like nerdiness and the same geek um, atmospheres, but they were just different time periods. So funny. Yeah, you were what, Kirk, right? Into Picard? Uh, yeah. Yep, Kirk and Picard. Um, yep. Kirk was first. Yep, I caught the tail end of Picard right into Voyager in, in my Star Trek watching. Every yep. Monday night, 9 p.m., Voyager would come on. Voyager was good. Don't get me wrong. Voyager was good. Um, yep. uh, of course, then we had Deep Space Nine in there as well. I was a yep. big Deep Space Nine fan. So that was a good one. 
But uh, it, it, it's good seeing these callbacks here. And, you know, from those that have watched Voyager, seen Seven of Nine now, where she's much more, especially looks much more human, acts much more human. But because oh, yeah. of that, she realizes the basically PTSD that is now a human attribute that has now come to light of the different experiences she's gone through as being a Borg. And yeah, it's all resolved around like losing their free will. Right. Uh, that's what I was going to say is uh, they, they, you can really kind of see in her emotions that she struggles with her humanity side of things. Um, you know, seven of nine is pretty interesting because um, she had Borg implants put in her when she was a baby. So that makes her pretty much a precious commodity in, uh, in this society and the way things are. Um, she's kind of a one of a kind. So it's cool that they brought her back and how they've, uh, how they've fit her in. She's kind of yep. that, that rogue, uh, doesn't really know where she fits in right now, but she, she does, but she doesn't. So, yep. yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it's a neat little, little story. I hope that, uh, you know, I hope they end it right with her and, and they are able to, to keep her in the show. Agreed. And from what we've seen so far, she's going to be a mainstay, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, then again, they've killed off some people uh, that we thought were going to be mainstays and well, they're, they're dead now. Uh, yeah. Which gets us into episode six with. Um, actually, no. Yeah, it was in episode six. Pretty mm-hmm. sure where the um, Soji, which we hadn't mentioned it and it was actually called out in a uh, happening in episode four previous or previous episodes that is the quote unquote twin sister to Dodge, the female that actually ended up being killed by the Romulans right in front of Picard. Yeah. Um, that apparently was also Android in line of the Android type that data was, which is why Picard's been so focused on saving Soji or Dodge originally, and then it was Soji because in kind of remembrance of Dodge. Right. So we've been following the storyline of Dodge in episode six. It basically comes to a head. This, this, this Romulan has been courting her, has um, tricked her mm. into revealing what, what the secret Romulans have always wanted. What's the home planet? Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for, for you guys who have actually been watching the show, you probably, uh, you know, probably have caught up to this point, but, uh, this one was, this one was cool because it, it brought that, um, kind of secret spy mentality into thing. You know, Narek and his sister are after this home world information and they're trying to do it in two different forms and fashions. Narek seems to be very logical and smart in the way he does things his sister um is brute force but she basically comes in and you know if you don't give it to her she kills you he uh Narek is a little bit different so Narek is playing an angle and it ends up working out for him in this episode they they find the information that uh soji has and it's funny because you know in the in the early episodes with picard they they found those paintings of uh what data was out in the orchard painting. Yep. And, uh, you know, now we've got Soji and, and Dodge, the twins, which was data's daughters per se. So, um, they've, they've done a good job. I, I like, I like how they're tying the story in. It leaves a little bit of mystery. There's plenty of action. There's some good drama amongst a few of the, the characters. Um, I think so far out of all of them, of course, Picard is my favorite, but I really like Rafi's character. Rafi, Rafi kind of brings a, um, a motherly perspective to the group. You know, she's older. She's been with Picard for a long time and she used to, she used to, uh, you know, serve under him. They've been friends. Uh, and she's just, she's really rough around the edges. So she kind of brings yeah. this edginess to the show. Uh, I would, I would say, and this is what she, she calls herself, um, auntie Raj, uh, Rafi. Auntie. Yeah. Auntie, which, which fits because she doesn't, sometimes she doesn't follow the rules or sometimes she just does her own thing. 
but she oh, comes yeah. back and nurtures is sometimes when it needs to be, but then can be a spitfire the very next moment. So yeah. Uh, and old knows all the tricks in the book to get her way. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Super manipulative when it comes to that. And yeah. she's like the techie smart chick. So, yep. Yep. So, um, we, uh, basically end the episode with, uh, Merrick after he tricked Soji into digging into her memories, and revealing the location of her home planet. Uh, he tries to kill her. But yeah. just like with Dodge, when Dodge was attempted to kill the first time, she quote unquote activated uh, and all of her Android abilities come to the forefront uh, to, you know, all of a sudden she realizes, she, you know, she has super strength at that moment. She busts through the floor to escape, meets up with Picard. Uh, they then use some secret Borg technology to escape. So, um, yeah. That was that's that's where episode six ends. Soji is still alive. She is now with Picard, so they have now met up. Um yeah. and they have teleported to a planet um called Nepeth. Nepenth? Nepenthi? Uh, Nepenthi. 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 Thank you. Yeah. I was looking at the word and I knew I remember them saying it. But that's it. Yep. So So yeah. Um episode episode seven by far my favorite one. Just because of that nostalgia feel. Yeah. Yep. It was a good one. Um, it it ties so much of the story in. Um, of course, we'll we'll save the the review of it for for the seven, eight, nine, and ten. Um, I'm really excited to see what eight brings. Seven was kind of a one stop shop for the story. It had its place. They did their bit, and the story moves on. So we'll see what happens. This is uh, this has definitely been a, a good, good kickstart to a new Star Trek and uh, brings a little little lifeblood back into the series. Yep, definitely enjoying. I personally am enjoying this this new Star Trek that we're getting. Um, it's right in line you know, with the grittier version that we saw with. Um, that's the most gritty with Picard, but saw a lot of that with Discovery. Yeah, that I absolutely loved and cannot wait for the next season. Oh, Discovery was fantastic. There were some things that, you know, I didn't care for, but right. overall, the show, absolutely freaking fantastic. And uh, I'm excited for the next season. Yeah. So uh, we'll uh, we'll get to those episodes when they finally release episode 10. We'll put that in the next podcast following that. Abs- absolutely. Uh, now. Including a little bit of tech, it's it's been uh, it's been talked about for a while. I think it was back at CES. Yep, CES. Um, but it's an interesting four way for Alienware. Like I don't, honestly, don't know what they were kind of thinking. They're they're trying to get into the same spot of uh, like, hey, let's get into the handheld market. Let's try to go against Nintendo with the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> you know, I, Dell's Dell's a big company. They got a big checkbook. But yeah, I think it's, <laughs> it's late to the game. I mean, they're they're yep. years, they're years late, not not months. So I think well, it's a really cool concept. Um, and that's if you guys have no idea what we're talking about. Well, that is the Dell Alienware uh, Project UFO, their new handheld. Uh, basically compact PC device that they're, uh, yep. they're talking about bringing out. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. This seems like a novelty item for me. It wouldn't, I don't know if it would really be something yet. One, just because of the, I think the price, the price on it would just be too high. They haven't said how much it's going to cost, but I, I bet it's going to be a pretty penny. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, let me think about it. For For one, I was just, just looking over the titles and they do call it a concept. So you reference back to where we've heard concept before is back to concept cars and the cars that we see on those floors when they have that label are definitely, well, they're, they're a wow factor, no doubt about it. But though, if they ever make it to market, so this may never, uh, they're usually completely different. They're more yeah. um, realistic <laughs> in a lot of their features. So, uh, but with that, 
you know, just thinking about having having games on the go that are playable like it is would be interesting. Like, let's say that it doesn't actually have a hard drive except for OS. You bring along your portable hard drive, right? I don't even know if this is even possible, but I'm trying to think of storage here for especially the games that we have that are now approaching 100 gigabytes per game. Oh, they're huge. Just just ridiculous. But, you know, going around playing this, even on that aspect is um, we're, we're getting into game streaming now with GeForce Now and the other game streaming services where if you want to play a computer game, well, just pull out your phone, Bluetooth a controller, and let's go. And yeah. you have decent internet, but a lot of people are showing, showing to catch on with that. Um, yeah, I mean, you can talk about some of the features of the UFO. Uh, well, and I've not actually been able to, you know, put my hands on it because I wasn't at CES, but I've seen pictures right. of it. And, uh, you know, it's got a pretty sleek design to it so far. Um, it does have removable controllers, which, is, like I said, is basically a, a tiny PC. It's an Alienware PC and a really small form factor. Um, it kind of has that Nintendo Switch vibe with uh, Alienware's flair, uh, right. per se. So, you know, they they didn't really give a lot of specs on any of the information that I could find for it. Dell's kind of keeping that stuff under the wraps. Um, it's got R- RGB lights on it. They did say that the screen, um, its native is 720p. I think that's as high as the resolution will go. Mm. Okay. Um, outside of that, though, I couldn't find any specs like speeds graphic cards cpus any any of the internal guts of the thing i don't think they've got any of that listed yet yeah i think that goes back to the whole idea of a concept like they could even increase it between the release now to what it could be in the future um you know it, that and i've heard it's you know really heavy for being a handheld compared to what we're used for, for the switch and now even the switch light yeah so that, that yeah. and it's big. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is the pictures that I saw from the event um, comparative to the hand size of even a Nintendo Switch. It's nothing that looks like you would want to carry around in a bag right. because <laughs> of its size. I mean, I mean, we're talking almost almost as wide as what a, like an Xbox One looks like. Not thick, but wide. So it's got a fairly wide uh, look to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and like they said, it, it was pretty hefty. So I'm guessing it's, uh, you know, nothing that you would want to take on your 12 hour flight to wherever you're going and uh, carry that in your bag. A little, little bit harder to pull that one out. Um, yeah. and go, and like even, even the control schemes with when it, when you take off the controllers and plug them in and put them into their little, um, their combined dock that makes them, makes it together feel like a controller. It's, pretty big like uh uh, in concept we could see it hit and it could be more uh, smaller to be more uh transportable i should say i don't know i'm interesting they come out with that it's a little late there a little late it is a little late um you know i think they've got Three big things. One, um, just the whole, they are coming late to the game. The price, I mean, we're, we're seeing a market that um, for devices like that are, are pretty saturated in, in the areas that they're specializing in. And you can get those devices for pretty decent amount. They're portable. They do lots of things. Um, they're doing them pretty good. So Dell's now coming into that way late and they're going to have to figure out their own way of doing things if they actually end up pushing this forward. And then just the whole, will they be able to gain momentum with their customers? I mean, Alienware isn't the cheapest thing out there on the market by any means. Their, their PCs are way expensive when it comes to what you're actually getting, if you ask me. So. I don't know. I think uh, I think they've got a lot of 
a lot of hurdles and a lot of roadblocks to to come over. Yeah, but we'll and, see what happens. That's not saying they may, you know, if they don't just abandon it. Yeah, so it could be. Maybe yeah, they got the feedback from see that's like, yes, this may not work. But people are already pretty rooted in their switch right now, myself yeah. included. I, I love my switch. I, I would I would not give my switch up for a new piece of technology. I mean, even though it is, you know, uh, cool looking tech and you'll be able to play PC games. Um, I've got a laptop that I can carry in my bag that will do just the same thing. And I already own it. I got to spend no more money. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. So, so we'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we called this episode. Uh, it's contagious for a couple of reasons. As you guys know, um, the old coronavirus has kind of hit and there's multiple things that have been talking about shutting down and just all kinds of crazy stuff. So. Uh, we wanted to talk about a few things that we saw in the news uh, from kind of the the nerdy and gaming aspect of things. And one of those is E3 2020. As we know, yep. that's one of the biggest gaming conventions in the world. And uh, it's one that uh, Victus and I have always followed and have wanted to go to for years. And we always cover it on the show. So we always end up doing an E3 20 or an E3 kind of preview um, things that we want to see um, people that are so-called scheduled to be there, but we're actually not going to be getting that this year because uh, E3 came out and said uh, we're officially canceling the show for this year because of the things going on with uh, Corona and all that. Yeah. So, well, and just, I mean, just talking about E3, um, it was already suffering as a conference because of some major pullouts. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, from presentation at the conference, you know, you had the big one, Sony, um, and other other people had been kind of toning down on their presence at uh, 83. Now that that's from a that's looking at it from us remote users actually going there. There were still a lot of developers going to be there, connections to happen. So. Uh, but it was changing. Um, uh, what's his name? Jeff, that usually does the MC for a lot of events. Oh, um, yeah. That did the Jeff Knightley? I think, I think it's that, Jeff Knightley. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff Knightley. Um, he reported that he, after almost 20, 15 years of being um, at the E3 and doing an event, he was no longer going to uh, MC or be a part of that. So there was yeah. that. Uh, Sony uh, has continued to not be there uh, and, and you were getting hints that several others were going to do the same. So, yeah, definitely not E3 of old like we like we used to get. Right? Yeah. Um, we'll see. We'll see who picks up the slack as far as I was, maybe maybe companies just go their own separate ways. You know, we've we've had PlayStation PlayStation now's. Or their their little conference thing that usually happens. Nintendo Directs, they have their own thing. Um, yeah, Xbox Microsoft. has about once a year their kind of own thing. Yeah. Uh, well, and there's other gaming this one conventions out there. So, right. Yeah. Or, or awards, or were they break announcements like Xbox announced the Xbox One X or showed off the Xbox One X at the Game Awards? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that companies still have plenty of outlets to be able to, you know, show their show their products and and, and build that hype with their customers. Um, E3 was just kind of the biggest and well known out there. But um, the the company who actually puts this on and organizes E3, which is ESA, uh, did say that there might be an option of doing an online E3. Now, how they plan on doing that, I don't know. Um, they didn't give any details or specifics. And honestly, that's nothing that I would probably want to even watch. Yeah. Well, I mean, as you're not getting a lot of the, the big mainstays of E3, um, you know, being there in the person, like I said, is completely different than actually watching remote. But that's that's usually a lot of we watch. So have a big announcement. You have the you have the people picking it apart, going through interviews. And it kind of felt like a 
an entire week of news dedicated to just gaming for us that didn't attend it or were attending it remotely. Yeah. So it felt good for that. Um, and maybe we may still get something like that. I think they were talking about moving some of their stuff to online or the individual companies were that we're planning on discussing things at E3. And, you know, if, but I remember, if, you know, five, six years ago, E3 was the be all end all for new stuff. Like even even on the fringe announcements, you could get like, oh, I, I yeah. still think back about uh, Metroid Prime 4, right? Nintendo announced that at or at their event of E3. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that was always exciting. But uh, yeah, it's definitely changed for sure. Um, and, you know, the. This conference isn't the only one that is kind of uh, taking a hit because of that. It's not even the only company. I mean, we're seeing things outside of stuff like this. I mean, take um, what used to be Guardian Con, for instance. Yep. Um, I can't think of the name of what Guardian Con GTX. changed to. Uh, uh, Gaming Community Expo. Yes, Gaming Community Expo. So, I mean, uh, we just got emails on that one that... Uh, <laughs> The, because of the safety concerns, they're actually closing that one down um, for this year as well. So, I mean, the, you know, there's some legitimate concern out there. Definitely. Um, I saw a new statement where Disney is putting a pause on all Marvel filming right now for all of their TV shows. And uh, they've actually closed the Disney World Park down as well. Yep. They said that's uh, the, only what the fourth time in history of the park ever closing, if yeah. I remember right. Yep. And it all revolves around just taking precautions um, about, you know, being in large crowds, making sure there's social distancing is the big point term right now. Yeah. Which basically says, you know, just, you know, just keep distance, um, taking all the steps, of washing your hands, which you would think is, uh, you would think thing. that is a natural thing to do anyway. <laughs> That's the thing. But honestly, hard, the hardest thing for me personally is like not touching the face, not touching yeah. your own face. I, right. I, will, I will absolutely admit that's how, you know, I, I, I move around when I think, when I talk. And so I'm sitting there like, you know, I'll, I'll use my beard as a, as a think, right. Yep. I'm sitting here thinking. So same. Um, and then other people, you know, they'll, they'll do stuff. They'll, you rest your head in your hand or whatever it may be. So that's all around that's all regarding this and the biggest ones you know as with cruise ships as with airlines with all those they're just by themselves petri dishes for <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> spreading up stuff so that there's been flu outbreaks on 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 cruise liners uh, you know people get sick with a, a certain strand of the flu they get on a plane then you have the chance to get sick on that as well so it's it's all about enforcing that and unfortunately the conferences that's People are very close to each other throughout the conference, <laughs> especially the really packed ones. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. E3, of course, was the first casualty. There was many more after that. Um, we'll see those conferences that are in the June, July, August timeframe to see if they get affected as well. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, keep up to date and watch those feeds and we'll uh, we'll do our best to uh, Keep up to date with all the things coming out as well, guys. But, uh, I think that pretty much wraps up this evening. So I just want to say a big thanks to everyone. As always, you guys rock. And uh, honestly, we just hope that you guys are safe and secure and you guys have not caught any of these bugs floating around. So uh, a big thanks to all of our listeners out there. You guys rock. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we end this on again. Be safe, take precautions regarding um, everything that's going on. Um, and thank you for listening to our content, providing feedback. Um, the support is greatly appreciated. We're just a couple dudes that enjoy talking about all things geekery. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the All Things Geekery podcast with any of your favorite podcasting apps or drop us a review on iTunes or Spotify as those reviews do greatly help us grow. Yeah, and you guys can find us out on our social media, specifically Twitter. You can find me at XDetachedX. You can find Victus out there under at VictusATG. And you can find our ATG Twitter account at the ATGCast. 
make sure you guys swing by, shoot us a note. We always love hearing from you all. And with that note, if you guys ever want to hang out with Victus, then go check him out over on his Twitch stream. He is doing a fantastic job growing that thing. And personally for me, make sure when you guys go over, you hit him up on Mondays and you just blow his feet up with all kinds of ridiculous songs. Yes. Yes. Uh, specifically, or, or depending on the game, I might continue that throughout the week, but uh, I usually try to keep Mondays as Monday music madness to keep song crest going. Uh, but I try to stream every weekday night. So Monday through Friday, starting at 830 Central Standard Time. Uh, was going through Minecraft, but starting uh, Monday. So today, uh, if we're if it this gets released on Monday, Ori the Blind playthrough, we'll we'll get to that and maybe go into Ori and the Will of the Wisp, as I will more than likely enjoy the crap out of both those games. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, speaking of enjoying things, bringing from one of our partners over at Into the AM. If you guys are looking for some sweet clothing, then stop by, check all their stuff out at intotheam.com. And if you guys find anything you like, just use the code ATG at checkout for a 10% off of whatever your total is. But guys, that wraps up this podcast. So as always, you guys stay awesome and we will see you in the next episode.